Imagine suffering a plane crash above the ocean, with only you and one other passenger surviving. Both of you get washed up on a deserted island, with nothing but sandbanks and palm trees. Once you wake up on the shore and look around, you notice the other survivor's footprints. Looks like he woke up before you. As you explore the island, you find him sitting on a huge pile of coconuts. Turns out, while you were unconscious, he went around and collected every single coconut on the island for himself. Coconuts that you would also need if you don't want to starve. Of course, you could go and uh, try your luck catching some fish along the shore, but according to statistics, 9 out of 10 startup fishermen end up dying of hunger in the end. The coconuts are your only realistic chance at survival. So you ask him, uh, can you give me some coconuts, please? And he says, sure, I can give you some coconuts if you suck my dick. You are faced with a conundrum. Do you suck the coconut man's dick? Let's keep this question in mind for later. My political views, and consequently my urban planning and transit views are all informed by one overarching value. I want as many people as possible to live the best lives they can with the largest possible degree of freedom. In practice, this means that every adult person should be free to do whatever they want as long as they don't harm others physically, mentally or financially. And just to clarify, I am pro-choice. I don't think the fetus is a full-fledged person, so the mother's interests should take priority. So as a freedom-loving person, it should be self-explanatory that I support ideology such as free market capitalism or even anarcho-capitalism, right? So what do these two ideologies entail? In a free market capitalist system, the economy operates with very little to no government intervention. Now keep in mind that we're only talking about the markets here. In every other aspect of life, the government can be very much repressive. For example, even totalitarian dictatorships can be free market, or at least lean towards it. In contrast, anarcho-capitalism is a system without a government, or at least a centralized institution able to effect coercion on you. Everything is left up to the free market and the people's self-organization. And I'm here to make the case that within a short amount of time, both systems would devolve into a horrifying authoritarian dictatorship. But how come these two ideologies would bring about the exact things they are designed to alleviate, namely oppression and coercion? Let's take a look first at free market capitalism. And my question to you is, is your workplace democratic? And by that I mean, do you as an employee have a say in how your workplace is run? Well, not really, right? Maybe in like a very small business, but even then you don't have any say in the meaningful decisions. Like if there's, say, five of you working at a small restaurant as waiters, you can ask the owner to, for example, rearrange the tables a bit, because right now the layout is super inconvenient to navigate with a bunch of plates in your hand, but the outcome of that request is still completely determined by the goodwill of the owner. They can say, yeah, sure, how do you want to organize the tables? Or, nope, sorry, the layout is good the way it is. And for me, this is like a little chiefdom, if you will. It's a small community, you get the chief running things, and everyone can just go and petition the chief personally if they want to. But see, the outcome of the request is still determined completely by the chieftain. Even if all five of you go to them and say, so here's a petition, all five of us have voted to rearrange the table layout, the chieftain can still go, yeah, I disagree with that, so too bad. We end up with a system where the will of the people will be taken into account if, and only if, a. The leader is a nice person. B. The leader is afraid that some of the subordinates might quit and so they would need to spend more time and money on additional recruitment. Or C. The leader believes that the new table arrangement would lead to more efficient work and so the business would make more money. So here, whether the will of the people will be taken into account depends on A. Personal kindness B. Fear of losing money and C the promise of more money. So as you can see, this is not exactly the perfect recipe for freedom. So what happens in a bigger business with more employees? Big business takes the concept of chiefdom and upgrades it to a totalitarian dictatorship. As Bob Black wrote in his essay The Abolition of Work, work makes a mockery of freedom. The official line is that we all have rights and live in a democracy. Other unfortunates who aren't free like we are are forced to live in police states. These victims obey orders or else, no matter how arbitrary. The authority is keep them under regular surveillance. State bureaucrats control even the smaller details of everyday life. The officials who push them around are answerable only to higher-ups, public or private. Either way, dissent and disobedience are punished. Informers report regularly to the authorities. All this is supposed to be a very bad thing. And so it is although it is nothing but a description of the modern workplace. A great example of this is when major corporations try to prevent workers' unions from forming, also known as union busting. A practice that is illegal, mind you, but they still do it anyway. For example, have you heard about this company called Tesla? and its owner, Elon Musk. And to quote from a Vox article titled Elon Musk Broke US Labor Laws on Twitter, 
Tesla tried many different tactics to stop workers from forming a labor union. Tesla workers distributing pro-union leaflets in the parking lot in their time off were harassed by three security guards. A supervisor later warned them that they could be fired for distributing those leaflets. Summoning the organizers into his office, Elon Musk illegally tried to dissuade the workers from forming a workers union. And, as leaked emails have shown, the HR department tried to put the organizers into management so they won't be able to organize a union on the factory floor. And then, once again illegally, Tesla banned employees from wearing pro-union t-shirts and buttons. And, also illegally, Tesla fired one of the organizer's co-workers, who criticized Tesla employees who spoke out against a union-backed bill. And then, repeat after me, illegally, Elon Musk tweeted out the following. Nothing stopping Tesla team at our car plant from voting union. Could do so tomorrow if they wanted, but why pay union dues and give up your stock options for nothing? Our safety record is two times better than when the plant was UAW and everybody already gets healthcare. Uh, okay. In other words, nothing stopping the peasantry in our kingdom from enacting democracy. Could do so tomorrow if they wanted. But why get your head chopped off for nothing? Law and order is two times better than when kingdom was under Louis XIII, and we already have the code Louis. Alright, so at this point, what real choice does the employee have? Proponents of free market capitalism usually bring up the fact that the workers can just switch workplaces or, you know, just move to another city. This is the freedom that workers have. But is it though? You know, changing your workplace is not an easy thing to do. I know because I've done it before. It's long, time-consuming, financially difficult. Chances are you'll be without a salary for at least a month. Not to mention how stressful it can be. Not to mention, the older you get, the more difficult it will become to get hired. I know people personally who tried to change their jobs in their mid-40s. Despite them being super qualified with ton of experience, in a booming job market, it was still super difficult. Also, what if there's nothing for you to do in your area? What if you live in some small town in some flying overstate with like one Walmart and two other workplaces, and you want to quit your current job because your employer wants to cut your salary to $5 per hour and increase your work hours to 16 hours per day. Because under free market capitalism, they are allowed to do that. Trust me, there's a lot of things corporations would do under a free market system. Like violating your privacy, online or offline, or selling off your sensitive information for money. Speaking of which, today's video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is a tool that encrypts your data and hides your virtual location, thus protecting your privacy and allowing you to bypass region locks. With Atlas VPN, you're going to have access to all that content on streaming platforms such as Netflix that has been previously logged away from you. All you need to do is open the application, pick out a server from the list, and you're done. Atlas VPN also comes bundled with a nifty breach scanner feature. Open the menu inside the app, enter an email address, and the app will show you whether there have been any leaks associated with that email address. And, as an added line of defense, the app also allows you to block unwanted trackers from websites. Just flip the switch and you're done. Atlas VPN runs both on desktop and on mobile. And of course it's compatible with all major operating systems. Right now Atlas VPN is running a huge discount on their 3-year plan. This means you can subscribe to their services for just $1.39 per month. This and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Of course this offer won't last forever, so do check it out. Link in the description. Protect your privacy and don't let region blocks stop you. Take advantage of this insane discount today. Thank you for checking out Atlas VPN. Ads like this help support the show. You will find my affiliate link down in the description. According to proponents of free market capitalism, if you are out of options, your main recourse is just to move to a different city. Now, of course, this can be a fine solution, but we cannot ignore just how destructive it can also be. Moving to a new area can be hugely stressful. I know because I've done it before. Not to mention, if you move from some flyover state to, say, a coastal state, you'll be leaving behind friends, family, acquaintances, i.e. you will lose your social safety net and you will lose your community. And this is made all the worse if you have, say, school-age children. You have to take them with you. That means leaving behind their school, their friends, hell, even maybe their boyfriends or girlfriends, the teachers they knew, the neighborhood they grew up in, maybe even the grandparents or other relatives who also live there. Now, I'm no child psychology expert, but I don't think for some reason that that's particularly conducive for the child's development. The only group of people who would not be affected by the negative consequences of moving that much would be young adults between the ages of 18 and 25, who are hyper online, don't leave the house that often, and have very few to no real-life friends. And so let us now talk about anarcho-capitalism and what its proponents want to bring about. 
And so as we discussed before, free market capitalism doesn't want government influence in the market. However, the state can be very much present in other aspects of life. For example, they can still provide public services and infrastructure next to the private ones. Anarcho-capitalism, however, in its primal form, is a stateless society. There is no government. Everything depends on people's self-organization and the free market. All the functions that were performed by the government previously are now completely privatized. Meaning you could live on your private property and freely contract with anyone else Else without any coercion as long as they basically just don't mess with other people, also called the non-aggression principle. This means that technically you would be able to live a life of absolute freedom. Well, until the Amazon Gestapo shows up and tells you that you are now under the rule of holy Jeff Bezos the first, and anyone opposing him will be decapitated in an Amazon warehouse, and their body parts will be sent to their family members as a warning in boxes with same-day Amazon Prime delivery. But hey, if you don't agree with this, you'll be perfectly free to start reciting the non-aggression principle until the firing squad officer tells you to shut the fuck up and keep digging. So I believe by now all of us can start seeing the problem, the fatal flaw at the core of free market capitalism, and consequently anarcho capitalism. Capitalism. Both ideologies seek to increase the power and influence of institutions that are autocratic in nature. Traditional corporations are set up like dictatorships. The owner has absolute control, and the subordinates can only hold the owner accountable through a government, which in the first world is a parallel, democratic, more powerful power structure, and so it can hold the corporate autocratic power structures accountable. If you get rid of it, then the only game remaining in town will be the autocratic power structures, meaning they'll be the ones with ultimate control. In free market capitalism, they'll control the economy, and who knows, maybe more things by proxy, and in anarcho-capitalism, they'll control everything. And guess what? Coercion happens to be the central part of any autocracy. So if your goal is the lack of coercion, then free market capitalism or anarcho-capitalism should be the last things you would want. And I'm confident in making this statement because coercion already exists in the current system, and it's not coming from the government. If your only choice is to work some shitty job or be homeless, as is the case for millions of people, then I would say you are not really free. I mean, hey, you do have the option to quit and be homeless, but is that really the type of freedom you would want? And so let us now circle back to the original question. Do you suck the coconut man's dick? Hey, you're free not to, uh, with dying of hunger as the consequence. And that I believe to be coercion. If you want a system with the maximum possible amount of freedom and the minimum possible amount of coercion, then if I were you, I would not base it on the current form of capitalism, a system that is autocratic in nature. But I do think there is a solution actually, namely workplace democracy. Give workers more control over their own workplace. Curtail the absolute power of business owners. Let workers democratically decide how profits will be allocated. So I would personally just give a tax break to any worker co-op firms and see if they work out. If they do, hell yeah, let's have more. If not, well, I guess we'll just have to figure out something else. But there are pretty successful examples already, so I have no doubt they would work out actually. Now upon hearing this, you might ask, okay Adam, but if co-ops are so good and you know better than traditional firms, how come we still have traditional firms? How come we haven't transitioned into worker co-ops? Well, consider the following. Just because a system is better, it doesn't mean that we will automatically transition to it. The prerequisites of capitalism existed centuries before capitalism itself. And I do believe that the next step after uh, late-stage capitalism, the system we have currently, would be co-op based capitalism. In any case, we need something new and we need it now. And free market capitalism or anarcho-capitalism are just not going to cut it. They're just more the same. And I believe we've all had enough of that already. You know, coconuts and all. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. And do check out my Patreon. Link in the description. And I'll be seeing you next time.